very familiar passage, passage 10, verse 10, says, For the love of money is the root of all, all evil. In 1 Timothy, Paul here in chapter 1 as well as chapter 6 is warning Timothy about the pitfalls of ministry. He warns him about the most dangerous and destructive enemy of the faith is the desire to be rich. That's the having the, the idea that, that, that I want to be rich. It, it, it causes a lot of us to stumble and, and to fall into pitfalls in ministry. The prevailing view of the New Testament times was that wealth was a sign of God's favor and poverty was a sign of God's disfavor. So if you were rich and if you were wealthy, that simply means that God had favor on you. And those that are poor, that means that God has this favor. Meaning maybe something you've done, you, you've sinned for some reason, God does not approve of you. You have many of the preachers today, prosperity preachers, that preach that God wants everybody to be rich, wealthy, and wise. They teach you how to pimp God. They teach you how to get a blessing from God. You simply send me. Uh, your tithes and offering, you send me your money, and I'll demand that God open the windows of heaven, and God bless you. A lot of the prosperity preachers will tell you that there's no way, shape, or form that nobody should be poor. It is God's mindset, and it is God's idea that everybody ought to be rich. Jesus spoke more about money than he did about love. Because the desire of wealth is one of the biggest hindrances for entering into the kingdom of God. He said that it is easier to take a camel through the eye of a needle than it is for the rich man to enter into heaven. He didn't say it was impossible, but it's highly likely. You ever tried to thread a needle? I remember growing up, my grandmother and mother, they used to lose the little metal thing that you thread the needle with. And they will get you to thread the needle. You remember, you take the, the thread and you will wet it and turn it. And, and you'll sit there and you will try to get that, that thread through the eye of that needle. Just imagine a camel trying to go through an eye of a needle. This is what God is saying about riches and wealth in people's lives. He said it's easier to drive a camel through an eye of a needle than a rich man to make it into heaven. Now, he's not saying that there's anything wrong with being wealthy, but when wealth is your priority in life, then it becomes a problem. Matthew said, what profit is a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What profit is it for God to give you everything in this world, and because of money, you lose everything, die, and go to hell? Got a lot of these rich entertainers, these lot of these rich folks that's really wealthy and 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 and, and has plenty of money, but yet the, the money has become their God, and because the money is their God, God has given them all of this, but yet in the end they're gonna lose it all because they will be eternally dangled. But yet we ought to understand what profits the man to gain the whole world, to have this world, and yet you die and lose your soul. The love of money has destroyed more lives and more families than anything else. More than 50% of all marriages end because of money. Countries begin wars uh, because of, of money, the desire to gain, to have wealth, and to have power. We live in a world that is materialistic. We live in a, in a world where we... Uh, 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 mainly buy things with money that we don't have to impress people that we don't even like. We live in a society today that's materialistic. We normally don't buy anything with cash. We normally buy, pay for it, it later. I'm not worried about it. I'll, I'll pay for it at a later date because I want what I want and I want it now. Amen. We desire to have more than what we need. When I was growing up, my mom and them would call it running with the Joneses. You know, boy, you're trying to keep up with the Joneses who have the biggest and baddest car, who has the latest uh, gadget. If somebody get an iPhone 5, you got to get a 7. If they get a 7, you got to get a 9. If your, your screen is 5 inches, they got to get 6. But it's all about trying to keep up with what's going on in the world. That's the reason why so many homes are in shambles today. It's because of those that do not have their priority together because they're trying to outdo one another. But I want you to ponder this question as we get into the text. What is wealth? What is wealth? What, what, is it, what, what does it truly mean to be, to be rich? The world has a 
different view than Christianity. The world views wealth as a wealthy as uh, uh, someone like Bill Gates, Donald Trump, Jay Z, Beyonce. This is what the world views as as being wealthy. On the other side of the coin, the world views those that are have a low income, those that are struggling, those that, that are robbing Peter to, to pay Paul. They say that these people are poor. This is what the world says. But listen, the scripture tells us to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is being wealthy. Amen. It's not about the money that you have in your pocket. It's about the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ that the scripture says that we are wealthy not only in this life, but also in the life to come. Jesus said, I come that you may have life and have it more abundantly to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Having a relationship with Jesus Christ is what the Bible calls wealth. And that's totally different from what we see in the world today as what the world calls wealth. And we got the New Age movement today that Oprah and a lot of these gurus are, are uh, with the New Age movement. They say that there is a God and God created the world. And then God just sit back and let the world run. And he just sits there and watches and sees how everything is going to pan out. That we in control of our own destiny. There is no God that intervenes in our life. We can see throughout uh, the Bible that God does not just sit back and just watch us. God intervenes in our life. He intervenes in time. God intervenes. He just does not sit back and watch us and sit there and see what we're going to do next. Without helping us, God is there to help, to provide, to protect us. But this New Age movement allows you to be your own God. Paul warns young Timothy about the dangers and the desires of, of being well, being wealthy. Now, the Bible makes it clear that there's nothing wrong with being rich. You know, you had a lot of folks in the Bible that were rich. Job was one of the richest men that there was. David was rich. Solomon was rich. Abraham was was rich. You have a lot of folks that, that are rich, and I'm not hating on rich folk because I'm not rich. That's what a lot of preachers will say. Well, he's just saying that because he's not rich. That's not the point at all. It's not about being rich. He warns him about the pitfalls and the dangers of desiring to be wealthy. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy, but when it becomes your priority, then there is a problem. See, Timothy uh, is warned about the desire uh, of becoming rich it brings about destruction. Paul admonishes Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. That ought to be his priority in ministry. It's not to receive money or not to say how wealthy I can be or what kind of car I can drive. But the main priority in ministry uh, ought to be ministry. That ought to be our, our priority. Preaching the word of God, being obedient to the word of God. But so many people have gotten sidetracked and now their priority now has become finances and money. I listened to one guy on TV, that's all he talked about. And uh, we had a conversation. I would have a problem if I went to that church. only thing he talked about is how many uh, Bentleys he had or uh, how many homes he had. He had about 12, 13 homes all over the world. He got a Bentley for every day of the week. And you're sitting there, folks, are struggling to pay their light bill, struggling to get to work or uh, get to the church. They got to catch a ride, and you're sitting up there bragging about how many Bentleys you have. That's one of the problems that we find in Christendom today about these so-called preachers, that their priority is not in ministry, it's in trying to gain well, he talked about how he run with the basketball players and run with the football players. Now, how and what does that have to do with salvation? How can anybody hear the word of God and be saved with that kind of foolishness? There's four things, three things I want us to notice that I want us to observe about the perils of wealth. First of all, I want us to notice the principle of, of contentment recorded. The second thing is the perils of covetousness revealed. The third thing is the practice of commitment that is required. But notice point number one, the principle of contentment recorded in verse uh, 6, 7, and 8. But let's back up to verse 3. Let me read verse 3, 4, and 5, and then we'll go into 6. And it says, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome, not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's proud, knowing nothing, doting, about questions, strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railing, evil surmising, 
perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Listen, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. I want you to understand that it's not about the material things that you have that produces godliness in your life. It's not about what I have to say that God uh, has favor with me because of the type of car that I drive, because of the money that's in my bank account. Your material uh, wealth has nothing to do with your godliness or whether or not God is approved or disapproved with you. Remember, there's no chapter and verse divisions in the Bible. So there is an original uh, Septuagint. It, there is no chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. It's just one continual letter that was written to Timothy here in this text. So don't let the chapter and verse division fool you, but it's a transition. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. But notice the conviction there in verse 6. Wealth does not bring contentment. Just because you have money does not mean that you're going to be Content. The word content means an inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace in spite of our outward circumstances. That simply means that what's going on in your life should not be predicated upon your peace. It should have absolutely nothing to do with what's going on in your life, whether you have joy or not. Your joy is not predicated upon your circumstances. That simply means what I'm going through in life. Maybe I'm having a difficult time now, but the difficult times in my life should not involve or hinder me from having joy. This is how folks can have, go through uh, serious trials and tribulations and still come to church and he, they can still worship God because their circumstances has nothing to do with that joy. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it and the world surely cannot take it away. My joy is not predicated on what I'm going through in life. Paul is telling young Timothy that you need to be content. It refers to a state of mind, a calm and a satisfied feeling, and a freedom for murmuring and complaining and belly aching and griping and having a pity party. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you lost your car. But guess what? If God gave you that job, guess what? God can give you another job. If you lost your car, maybe God took that car away, but God can give you another car. God can do all things without the murmuring and the complaining and the belly aching and the griping because God knows all things. God knows whatever we're going through or whatever situation that we're in, God wants us in that situation yes. for a reason. Amen. Wherefore, we have to be content whether we like it or not. God knows all things. Paul said in Philippians 4.11, For I have learned in whatever state there would be to be content. He said, whether I'm abased or abound, whether good or bad, whether I'm rich or poor, it doesn't matter. Whatever state I am in, I should be uh, content because I know that I can do all things through Christ that, that strengthens me. God said, he shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. True contentment it comes from godliness in the heart, not wealth in the hand. A lot of people have it all, all mixed up. People depend on, on wealth for peace and, and assurance are never satisfied. Remember the man in the, in the Bible that had a barn and he had a prosperous crop. Instead of, uh, of giving the, the, the crop away, you had a lot of folks around that, that was poor. He could have simply just given it away. He had enough money to last him for a lifetime, but his mindset was, I'm not going to give to anybody. I'm going to keep it for myself. He tore down his barn, built a bigger barn in order to house all of the grain that he had, but he never thought about the other people, never thought about those that, that are in need. And most folks today, when they get their money, they, they're going to keep it all there. They're never satisfied. I remember one of the Rockefellers or the Kennedy, they asked the question, how much money is enough? He said, just a little bit more. How much is enough? Just a little bit more. I don't care what it is. You're never satisfied. You never come to a point where you say, okay, this is enough money. I can take the rest of this money and I can and I can give it to this charity. I can help these people. You know, you got folks and kids trying to get through college. Listen, I, I've got enough. I can utilize, utilize this to help other people. But we have the mindset that it's all mine. You've got to get your own. Being wealthy has nothing to do with the circumstances that surrounds us. But it has all to do with our relationship and Jesus Christ. Because you have money does not make you wealthy. Does not make you happy. 
we should be content with what God has given us and what God has provided for us. God is all that we need. God should be our all sufficiency. But just because you have a few dollars in the bank does not make you happy. And I notice that when it comes to suicide. You know, I've never seen a poor person commit suicide because he was poor. But I see rich folk committing suicide all the time because they're rich. The, the uh, Brumos, they used to own the Brumos Mercedes and Porsche. When I worked there after I got out of the military, he killed himself. He committed suicide because he had problems. One of the richest men in Jacksonville, but yet he couldn't cope with having the money. So he committed suicide. Just because you have money does not make you, you happy. You got more folks that are, that are rich sitting in the psychiatrist's office laying in a chair uh, with the doctor trying to tell them how many problems they have. I, I tell them, you got a problem with the money, just give it to me. Then you don't have to worry about it no more. Then you don't have to sit in the doctor's office. I know what to do with it. If you don't want it, if you can't handle it, simply just, just give it to me. You got a lot of folks think that, that if I had a, a wife and that, you know, I'll be happy, Lord. If I, if I just find somebody and I get married, I'm going to be happy. But the ones who got one, they trying to say, Lord, if I just get rid of this one, I'll be happy. So your, your, your happiness, your contentment is not built in anything other than your relationship with Jesus Christ. Once you have that relationship, you have that contentment, you have that joy and that peace. In whatever circumstances you're in, you can be content. Paul teaches that the possession of godliness uh, of piety makes a person independent of the outward circumstances of self-sufficiency, enabling him to maintain a spiritual equilibrium in the midst of both favorable and unfavorable situations, i.e. whether the good times or the bad times, I can still have my peace and my joy because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. I can be going through the storms of life and still have peace in the midst of the storm. Because I know that Jesus is in the storm with me. And I, and I know the scripture said that he would never leave me nor will he forsake me. I can do all things through Christ as he that's in me is greater than he that's in the world. I have that confidence. I have that assurance in Jesus Christ. But not only the conviction, but notice the certainty there in verse 7. And it says, for, that's a little Greek word, guard, which means because we brought nothing into the world. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. Let's go back to verse 6. But that's a transition. But godliness with contentment is great gain for because we brought nothing into the world and we can certainly carry nothing out. You must be content in whatever situation that you're in because all that you possess here on this side of the grave stays on this side of the grave. You brought nothing into this world, and you certainly can carry nothing out of this world. Everything that we acquire in life is irrelevant because everything that we possess in the world will be separated from us when we leave this world. Amen. The problem is that wealth does not always last. That which we have can be taken away in an instant, in a moment. God gives and God taketh away is what Job said. You remember several years ago the company called Enron. Enron, those guys were, were wealthy and they were rich. They laid down one night and the ne next morning they woke up, they were busted. You know, a lot of them took their own life because they say to themselves that, what is it? I have nothing else to live for. All of my wealth is gone. All of my, my life savings is gone. I have nothing else to live for. Those that were wealthy in Enron, one morning they woke up there the money was gone. You can have the crash of the stock market. You can have a, a health problem, downsizing. You can have a natural disaster. But we know when we leave here, we leave everything behind. Job twenty, Job one and twenty one says, and Job said, "Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return." Job understood that we that we will leave uh, everything in this world. We will leave it behind. Out of all the years I've been on earth and all the funerals that I have attended, I've never seen one time a hearse pulling a U-Haul. I've never seen them lower the casket and lower your Cadillac on top of it. Everything that, that, that you 
uh, possessed in this world, you're going to leave it behind. Like Job said, naked came I into this world, and naked shall I return. So it's irrelevant about some of the things that we are putting our trust and our confidence in in this world. You can go back to 1929, 30, 31, 33. Those who, none of us should have been alive back then, but it's called the Great Depression. It's when the stock market crashed and all of the folks that, that lost everything, the, the nice furniture that they had in the house, it came to a point where they were breaking it up and using it as firewood. They were standing in the long soup lines. So wealth is not guaranteed. You can have wealth today and it can be gone tomorrow. Not only the conviction, the certainty, but I want us to notice the command there. Look at verse number 8. And it says, but they that will be rich fall into temptations and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and in perdition. Listen. Wealth does not meet our needs. Wealth does not meet our needs. We understand that we brought nothing into this world and we can carry nothing out. Therefore, we should be content with the food, the clothes, and the raiment that we have. That's the necessities of life. This is what we uh, uh, need in order to, to survive. So they're saying, now the Bible here is saying in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Food, clothing, shelter are the necessities of life. God said, if you put me first in your life, God said, I guarantee you food, clothes, and shelter. Now, he didn't guarantee you that you're going to have uh, a Bentley. That's not what he said. He did not guarantee that you're going to have a mansion. Or that you're going to eat filet mignon. That's not what he said. But he guaranteed you will have food, you will have clothes, and you will have shelter if you put God first in your life. These are the basic needs, and without them, life cannot be sustained. Matthew 4 and 4 says, we, not live, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I remember when David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God will take care of of his people. God just required that you put him first, priority and preeminence on your list. But we live in a society that believes that our assumption is a symbol of our status. That simply means that it makes me who I am. A lot of folks believe that what they have uh, identifies who they are. That if I have a, 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 a 7,000 square foot home, or if I have a Mercedes being it defines who I am. I have the opposite mentality. When I get in the Mercedes, I make the Mercedes look better. Amen. The Mercedes don't make me look better. It does not define who I am. I can define what the Mercedes is. When I get in the Mercedes, it looks a little bit better, but a lot of folks think because of what they have, it identifies who they are. A lot of people think they're big ballers and shot callers and all of this simply because of what they, what they possess. So we should be content in whatever situation that we're in because God knows all about it. There's, there's nothing wrong with being comfortable, so don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with having a nice car. There's nothing wrong with, with having a, a, a nice, nice house and, and nice things. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not the point I'm trying to make. But the point I'm making is that when money becomes your priority and money supersedes uh, a God, then it becomes a problem with God. There's nothing wrong with having nice things, driving nice cars. There's nothing wrong with looking nice or looking good or dressing nice. But when that becomes your, your priority, there's the problem. But this should, whenever you strive for uncertain riches and make that the object of your pursuit, there is, lies the problem. No man can serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and, and money. It's either one or the other. You can only have one master. Either you're going to love God or you're going to love the world. You have to make a choice as to who you're going to serve. Paul says that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Even when I can't help myself, God said I shall supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory. When I can't get up out of the bed, when I can barely move, God said I still will supply your every need. So the money that you're making is not fitting or, 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 or paying the bills. It's, it's God in his power. But what happens if you couldn't get up and go to work? 
What happens if, if you have a problem or downsizing on the job? Wealth does not always meet our needs. But some people are never, never, never satisfied with what they have. We're always focusing on what we don't have instead of focusing on what we do have. I thank God that I have a house. It may not be the house that I want, but as far as I'm concerned, it's what I want. But a lot of folks may be driving the car. It may not be the car that you want, but you ought to thank God that you have a car to drive because there's many folks today don't have a house to live in, don't have a car to drive, don't know when they're going to get their next meal, when they take their next bath, have a change of clothes. So we ought to thank God with the things that we do have and start focusing on what we don't have. Amen. A lot of folks are not... Not satisfied. They're always wanting more. You got some folks that got their name on 20 different church rolls because they're never satisfied. They go from one church to the next church because never being satisfied. We're talking about the perils of, uh, of wealth. We've looked at first of all. Notice secondly, the, the perils of, of covetousness that is revealed. The perils of covenant revealed. We looked at the principle of, of contentment recorded. But notice secondly, the perils of covetousness revealed in verses 9 and 10. Notice the caution there in verse 9. But it says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation. So now he's saying he's not referring to folks that are rich. He's referring to those that have a desire to be rich. You ever met somebody in... And they'll tell you, you know what, I'm going to be a millionaire. You know, my desire is to be, to be rich. How are you going to do it? I don't know. They don't have an idea. It's not like you're going to go to college and, you know, you, you become a cardiologist or, or a surgeon or, you know, you start your own business and through the process you become rich. But a lot of folks just have the mindset that, listen, I'm going to be rich. I don't know how I'm going to do it. This is what I'm going to be. This is my desire. These are the ones that start selling Mary Kay. They start doing this, selling knockoff cologne and fire extinguishers because they told them about the Ponzi scheme, the pyramid scheme. They told them, listen, if you do this, you'll become a millionaire. But it's that desire to be rich. Be careful about those who are not rich. They have the desire to be rich. The desire to be wealthy is the result of a process of reasoning with the result that the desire has become a settled plan in the process. They have made the determination that I'm going to be rich, I'm going to be a millionaire, but they haven't figured out how. They just have a, a desire to be rich. This person has to have more than what they have in order to be happy. Let me say that again. This person has to have more than what they have in order to be happy. This is why people play the lottery. Because they need more than what they have in order to be happy. If you are playing the lottery, you are saying to God, God, I'm not content with where you have me. That I need to have more in order for me to be happy. I'm not happy driving the bucket that I'm driving or living in the house that I'm living. I need the bling bling. I need to, I need to be a big ball and shot caller. I am not happy with where you have me. I, would, I need a lot more in order for me to be happy. I'm not content with God, where God has me. For those that have that desire, you have to also remember what Proverbs uh, 23 and 4, 7, that your, your finances can grow wings and fly away. The Bible also says, fool and his money shall soon depart. Those that have a desire to be rich, what they have a desire for is they have a desire for power and popularity and position, the greed and grandness of that person. The only thing they want is recognition. They want, they want fame when they have the desire to be rich. But yet they have no idea about how they're going to get there. Let me just read one passage to you, Haggai. Don't turn to it. Let me read it to you. Haggai chapter 1, verses 3, 4, uh, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And it says, And they came here, come the word of the Lord, to Haggai the prophet, saying, It is time for you, O ye that dwell in the cedar houses, the expensive houses, these how while my house lie ways. Say, Now therefore, thus said the Lord of hosts, Consider thy ways. You have sown much, and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. Eat, drink, and are not filled. Your clothes but yet you're not warm, and you bring in earnings, and the earnings are your wages. He said to put it in a bag with holes. 
And that's the way a lot of folks are today because the money is their priority. You make all the money in the world, but guess what? By the end of the week, you're dead broke. You're still robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're still trying to make all the money, and then at the end of the week, you sit back and say, well, what? where did all my money go? You ever said that to yourself? Well, where did my money go? It's almost as if you got a bag with holes in it. This is one of the cautions that he said to young Timothy. Listen, uh, while being in the ministry, you have to be careful about that desire to be, to be wealthy, to be rich. I believe that a lot of preachers today enter into the ministry because it's a lucrative business. You know, I don't have to do very much. I can come and stand up in the pulpit for an hour. You know, on Sundays, maybe 35, 40 minutes on Wednesday. I can stand, spend the rest of my time on the golf course, and I can have a pretty lucrative uh, 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 lifestyle, but yet I don't have to do anything uh, to, to provide for it. But that's someone who uses the ministry as a job and not as a ministry. People often ask me, well, how much you charge to do a funeral? Or how much do you charge? I say, I don't charge anything to do a funeral. I say, because a funeral is part of ministry. When I start paying or allowing people to pay me or have a fee to do a, min to do a funeral or anything, it's no longer become ministry. Now it becomes a job. It becomes an occupation. Now I tell folks, if you want to give anything, you give it to the church. Don't give it to me personally because I'm in ministry. This is not an occupation for me. This is what is called ministry. But not only the caution, but notice the calamity there. And it said, they, they that desire to be rich fall in and trapped in three things. Notice it says, first of all, in that ninth verse, it says, but they which uh, will be rich, or uh, have desire to be rich, fall into temptations. First of all, it says into uh, temptation. That, that means the, that, that they are tempted to do that which is wicked or wicked things in order to accomplish their purpose. That's the first calamity. Folks that desire to be rich, that's not rich, that want to be rich, they'll do anything to get rich. They'll do anything, immoral, ungodly, it does not matter. They'll do wicked things. They'll steal whatever it takes to accomplish their purpose. It is extremely difficult to cherish, to desire, to be rich as leading purpose of the soul and be an honest man. Judas was one of the twelve that was with Jesus, but yet he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He sold them out. How much are you willing to sell out God for? A new house, a new car, money, prestige, power. Folks will sell out God when they have this desire to be rich and also says a, a snare or a trap, a net that is suddenly sprung upon them and they cannot escape. The idea is when the net is sprung, you ever seen a bird or a fish get caught in that? The more you twist, the more you turn, the more you get yourself entangled. This is the same idea where we get ourselves entangled in the desire uh, for money. It's not easily or easy to escape. It's just like drugs. The more drugs you do, the more you become entangled. The more money you make, the more that you become entangled. And it's harder and harder. It's more difficult for you to get out of it once you're in it. It's just like a trap that is that it's a snare or a trap that is sprung on you uh, and you don't even know it. And then as you move or you're trying to uh, get out of the trap, you become more entangled within the trap. But not only that, but it says uh, the foolish and hurtful lust, that desire for wealth. For those that are foolish or, or unintelligent, those that call hurtful or, or does a great deal of harm or injury to our morals. You know, those that desire to be rich normally don't have morals and values and principles. They'll do anything. They'll rob anybody. They'll steal from anybody. They'll even steal from their own parents. I even seen some that have plotted the murder or killed their own parents so they can gain the inheritance uh, ahead of time. But we see folks today when they have that desire for money, they have no morals. That desire for money can hinder your, your health or even be damaging to your soul, which drowns men in perdition and destruction. The meaning is the cause to sink as a ship that is submerged underwater. You remember the story of the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and Jesus asked him, he asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And he said that you need to keep the commandments. He said, all this I've done for my bar mitzvah. And he said, well, sell all that I have and, and follow me. Now, the young man was rich, 
But the young man said, I can't sell all that I have because I love my riches more than I love God. And this is most folks today, they love their riches more than God. They would rather try to work and gain a dollar bill than try to worship the Lord. Now, if you have to work on Sundays, there's nothing wrong with that if that's your regular schedule. But some folks make up schedules and they are trying to do this and do that, trying to gain a dollar instead of trying to give God the praise for giving you the money that you already have, the life that you already have, the home, the cars, the, the job that you already have. You ought to take the day and say, Lord, thank you for all that you have done. For me, but not only the caution, the calamity, but calamity, but notice the craving there in verse number 10. It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root to all evil. The apostle did not say that money is evil. Money is neutral. You can take, um, you can take a million dollars and put it in my hand. You can take a million dollars and put it in ISIS over in Afghanistan. You can put it in their hands. It's all depending on the nature of the person and how he used the money. So money is neutral. But it says, for the love of money is the source to all evil. And that word all there simply means all kind of evil is come out of the love for money. When I put money ahead of God, when money becomes my, my priority, when I love money more than God, that means all types of evil is born out of my love for money. The word covet there means to desire something that, that someone else has. To covet has that, has that desire. When you go back and look at Acts chapter 5, you go back and study Ananias and Sapphira. To have that desire to covet something that does not belong to you. You got a lot of folks today because of their craving, because of the love for money. They're in jail. A lot of folks that are dead. They lie, they cheat, steal, they forage uh, books in order to gain wealth. These are the folks that now that would have that desire to be rich. That money has become their God and they love money more than they love God. They're, they're locked up in jail. They'll lie, they'll cheat, they'll steal. They'll do anything to gain. A dollar. Folks are like that today. You have to watch. Everywhere you go, you have to watch, folks, because, listen, they'll do anything for a dollar bill. But not only the caution, the calamity, the craving, but notice the conscience there in, in the latter portion of, of verse 10. And it says, And they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Notice the deception there. First of all, under the conscience, notice the deception, they have been led astray, taken a wrong turn, they have wandered from the faith. You got a lot of these folks that you go on TV in, they wander from the faith. At one point in time, they was preaching the word of God, now it's prosperity, gospel, they were helping wealthy, name it and claim it, they, they've they turned to a vain jangling. It's simply a bunch of hot air. They have been helplessly seduced into deception. See, it used to be a point in time, I remember one of the preachers here in Jacksonville, when he was a young boy, he was a very prominent preacher that preached the word of God. Now that he's become rich, now he's lost his mind. You know, but at one point in time, he was a great, great preacher as a young man. But this is what money does to a lot of preachers. It destroys them. When you accept money, it limits your scope of, of preaching. When you love money more than God, there's certain things that you can't preach on because you're going to preach sermons that make everybody feel happy. You're not going to preach sermons that are convicting so folks might get convicted and they up and leave the church. You're going to always preach a sermon where everybody can jump up and shout and say, go ahead on, pastor, preach, pastor, and all of this. You can high-five each other and everybody go home all happy in your scene. See, when money is involved, then your scope of preaching is narrow. But when you're not accepting money, you're able to freely preach the word of God, whether they get offended or not, whether they leave or not. Amen. And if they leave good, that means it's working. Because the word's going to do two things. It's either going to draw you or drive you. That means it's working. But a lot of them have fallen into the deception. And the only thing they're concerned about, if you send me your dollar bill or you send me money, and I guarantee you, I'll open up the windows of heaven for you. I never understood that. Why can't I just pray to God and he just open up the windows for me without sending you uh, any money? That's a good racket. That's a good scheme. And they are fleecing the flock 
and they are taking some of the uh, the elderly life savings, taking it from them for the possibility of getting a blessing, which is not true. A lot of these folks are sending in their, their whole life savings to some of these charlatans that's been deceived. But notice also the distress there. And at the same time, the process of piercing is laid on their charge. But they pierce themselves all the way through or uh, all around with many griefs and, and sorrows. See, in the end, it's going to be griefs and sorrows. See, but the problem is, with such sorrows and painful reflection on their, their folly and the apprehension of, of their, their wrath, when they realize it, it's going to be too late. It's just like the prodigal son. He told his dad, listen, give me all the money that's coming to me. I want my inheritance now. And he went out and he spent it all in righteous living. When he came back home, he realized, that, listen, all my hopes and all my dreams have been lost because of the desire to be rich. I went out and went into some store and robbed a store or a connive and thought about how I can rob uh, the, the, the uh, Bank of America. And I've, I've caught, been caught now. I'm doing 30, 40, 50 years in prison. But when you realize it, it's going to be too late that you threw away all your hopes and your dreams because of the desire to be rich. He says, listen, young Timothy, as you're going into the ministry of those that, that are starting life, that graduating high school, you're going in, into the world, you have to remember that God should be your priority and not money. Amen. A lot of folks want to pick a career just because it's a lucrative uh, career, not because this is something that my heart desires or this is something that God wants me to do. I'm only going to pick it because I can make a lot of money. All my desire is, is to make a lot of money. But you understand that being wealthy, being rich has nothing to do with that which is in your pocket. But it has all to do with your relationship with Jesus Christ. We're talking about the perils of wealth. We've looked at the principles of contentment recorded. The perils of covetousness revealed. But thirdly and lastly, I want us to notice the practice of commitment that is required in verse 11, and it says, but, here's another transition, but thou, O man of God, listen to what you say, flee these things, flee, you know, that means to run, that means to take off like, like Joseph when he was in Potiphar's house, when his wife tried to uh, attack him, he left his coat and all that, took off, start running, he said, flee from these things, what things, from the love of money, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Paul addressed young Timothy as old man of God. It is describing what kind of man Timothy is. He's the man of God in contrast to the charlatans, to the false teachers that are, that are preaching a false, phony gospel. Paul says to Timothy, old man of God, I want you to flee the love of money. And it also told him to flee useful lust. Now, those are the only two times that I recall in the Bible that he told him to flee. It's money and lust. Paul says, O oh man of God, talking about Timothy's character, in contrast to the false teachers, he commanded him to flee. That means run, and that's in the continuing action. That simply means does not flee one time. That means keep on fleeing. Keep on running. It, from the love of money, from that desire to be rich, it's easy to get in ministry, become a pastor, and your first desire is, I want to be rich. And now I'll do anything. I'll lower my morals, my standards, my ethics. I'll lower everything in order to be rich. I'll sell God out. I'll preach sermons that are only going to make folks feel good. And a lot of people get into that rut because they want to have a, a mega church. They want to have the biggest church. They want to have the, the Bentley. They want to have the houses and cars. And they lower the standards because that desire for money. And before they know it, they've, they've found themselves into uh, destruction. It says making a habit of fleeing from the love of money. The love of money in ministry does more discredit than anything else. This is the reason why a lot of folks don't want to give. Don't want to give to the church because they see what the church or the pastor is doing with the money. For the love of money discredits or uh, discredits the, the, the church itself. A lot of folks will tell you, well, I'm not going to give no money to the, to the church and then the pastor going to ride around in, in the Cadillac and he's going to have this and, and I'm struggling to do this. 
See, it's a sad commentary when, when you have ministers and pastors that, that have a desire for money rather than have a desire for ministry. And for God, it's a sad commentary when men use religion for personal gain. You know, if, if, if I was to go speak somewhere, I don't, I don't even worry about a fee. If they give me one, fine. If they don't, fine. But you got some folks to tell you, listen, partner. Before I come, first of all, it's fifteen hundred dollars. You got to provide me with a hotel. And I mean, not just motel six or eight or whatever it's called, but I mean the Hyatt or the Hilton or whatever. I mean, then you got to make sure that I I have the car to drive at least, you know, a mid-size to to hire Mercedes or something to ride around in. While I'm there, you're going to have to give me comrades and make sure I get per diem and, and all my needs are taken care of, and then we can um, then we can talk about it. But that's the way some people are. They're not going to even come unless the dollar bill is right. That's called merchandising the gospel. But yet we ought to be able to do it in ministry, and if they give, they give. But it's a sad commentary when men use religion as personal gain because it's lucrative. If I got the gift for gab and I can just sit up here and, and blab a whole bunch of hot air and I can get enough folks to listen to me, I can be uh, wealthy and, and wise if I stand up here. And a lot of folks are, have that mindset. They use religion as just personal gain. When you start getting into Reverend Ike and a lot of those guys and uh, use it just, just for wealth. But Peter said that we are to shepherd the flock. Not for filthy lucre, the word shepherd, poet, meditate. That simply means to care for, to provide for. It is the responsibility of the pastor to care for the sheep, to care for the, the flock, not to not not for filthy lucre. I'm not here to gain money. I still have that responsibility for my family to care for them, that I need to provide for them as well. But that's not my priority in ministry. My priority is not to gain a dollar bill. My priority is ministry. And that which God has given me, I will use it to the best of my ability to do what I need to do in life. But we are to shepherd the flock. That means care for, protect, and provide for them, not for a dollar bill, but it ought to be for ministry. What happened if they made a law today? And they say no preachers from this point on can ever get paid. All preachers must get a job. How many preachers you think will still be preaching come Monday morning? How many preachers will work a nine to five and still do all that they do in the church? I guarantee you a lot of them will fall short and say, well, listen, what really? I guess this really wasn't my calling after all. John, see, this is what you call a hireling. These are the ones that's in it simply for a paycheck. These are the ones that's in it for the pay when he sees the wolf coming. Instead of like David, he went out and he protected the sheep from the lion and the bear. They'll be the first one out the door running when the enemy comes and leave the sheep to be scattered. And a lot of folks today are simply hirelings today. The word does not literally, the word does not literally mean uh, when you're talking about flee, it means to separate or withdraw oneself from that desire of having money. It does not mean like to literally run. Flee means to run. But he simply said you need to separate yourself from that desire of wanting to be rich. And it also goes for those that are in an everyday uh, work environment. You are to separate yourself from a desire of wanting to be rich. The only desire that you are to have is that desire to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the desire that caused me to be rich in this life and also in the afterlife. Notice the command there. Listen as I, as I close. In the latter portion it says, flee. Now when you run, you're running from something. But keep, keep in mind, you've got to run to something. So he's saying flee, run from the love of money. But he said, and follow after. That means to pursue after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and also meekness. It means to run swiftly after in order to catch a person or thing to pursue. It's not enough to flee, but we must also follow after. Paul gives us six things. That we ought to follow. First of all, he said we ought to follow righteousness. That means to conform it to do what is right before God and man. Not to be forced or coerced into doing it. We ought to just have that desire to do right before God and before man. It says godliness is piety before God, respect, 
Faith is faithfulness, dependability on God. Love is a godly love, love that sacrifices on behalf of others, a love that seeks to give and not gain patience, endurance, sticking to it when the going gets tough. Meekness is not weakness, but it's power under control, not blowing up, not losing your cool. And he said, these are the things that the man of God or those that are men and women of God are to pursue after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and, and meekness. But listen as I close. Paul warns Timothy and also the church about putting their trust and faith in, in money. He calls it... Uh, uncertain riches. That simply means that you can have money today and you can be broke tomorrow. You can have money today and before the end of the year there could be a, a crash in the stock market or you can be robbed or, or something can happen. You can lose your, your strength.